I'd like to welcome you uh, th this evening to uh, the presentation. Uh, this is the bicentennial of the, the birth of uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, 200 years ago on this very date uh, was the birthday uh, of, of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, you see on my um, the title page, uh, The Rebirth of Ulysses S. Grant, a recent interpretations of the Grant legacy. Uh, we're going to be exploring some of uh, the newer books on uh, Grant and how his image and uh, stature has been reinterpreted in recent times. So happy birthday uh, to President Grant. And uh, if we all had toast, we can maybe uh, sort of imagine you're making a toast to his birthday. And uh, welcome once again to this presentation. Uh, this, this slide sort of gives us a, um, a survey of why, uh, why the rebirth in uh, Grant scholarship. And uh, there are a number of reasons for it. Uh, first of all, there have been trailblazers since World War II, uh, among them the works of uh, Lloyd Lewis and Bruce Catton, uh, who have revisited uh, the Grant legacy uh, and have presented him in a much more positive way. Number two, uh, since 1968, um, through the early 2000s, uh, Southern Illinois University has released uh, 32 volumes of the papers of Ulysses S. Grant. And uh, these include uh, uh, speeches, uh, letters, uh, proclamations, and so forth. And also numerous critical editions of the personal memoirs have been released. Uh, thirdly, uh, historians over the years have examined the historical context uh, for the causes of the Civil War. Uh, Reconstruction, in, in particular, has, has uh, garnered a great deal of, of focus. And also placing uh, the Reconstruction era and the Grant presidency uh, in the context of the Gilded Age, that that's big money, uh, the oil barons, steel mills, uh, the railroad barons. Um, and the, the, the uh, country never really uh, figured out how to deal with uh, the rise of these uh, so-called robber barons. Uh, contemporary analyses of the shortcomings of the lost cause tradition, uh, which emerged at the early part of the, uh, uh, of the 20th century, uh, which tried to revisit uh, the, the legacy of the Confederacy, uh, and then as a result, trying to um, undermine uh, the Union uh, successes. A pl plethora of new biographies, research projects, <clears throat> and studies of Grant's 16 years of public service uh, in the last three or four decades uh, is, a, is, among, is among the, uh, the reasons why there's this rebirth of Grant scholarship. Uh, there's also been a renewed interest in uh, civil rights, and especially the, uh, <clears throat> the income, uh, the uh, uh, influence of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, uh, the 15th Amendment was championed, of course, by Grant. Um, the, the unfulfilled promises of the American Civil War, uh, we've been concerned about that. But also uh, libraries, like uh, there's a U.S. Grant Association, the U.S. Presidential Library in, guess what, in Mississippi State University, of all places, um, and many other places like uh, Galena and uh, Whitehaven Farms near St. Louis, uh, that have celebrated and kept alive uh, the Grant legacy. So all these uh, reasons in, in tandem uh, have contributed to a great uh, renewed interest uh, in the Grant legacy. Uh, there are two volumes of his work. Uh, that's a really big deal. And this began in the, uh, the 1960s, uh, collecting this, these documents uh, all the way up through the, uh, the early 2000s. Uh, this is the, uh, the Grant Museum and Library, the Presidential Library at uh, Mississippi State University. It's a long way for us to travel, but it's worth it. Uh, it's really elegantly done, uh, very professional. It's like a conference space, as well as a museum space. And this is where those, these documents are actually collected. Um, of course, um, the, the memoirs uh, have been very important. Uh, for the first 20 years after the release of the memoirs, uh, they were indeed uh, among the most read materials 
especially on the Civil War, uh, but on American politics uh, for, for, for a long time, uh, very, very um, long lasting as well, as we'll see. Um, of course, these the memoirs have been uh, more recently uh, uh, packaged in different forms and paperback and other ways, not just what you see up here in the at the front, uh, so that it's very accessible. And uh, Grant's memoirs have been uh, in in print. Uh, they've never been out of print, uh, which in itself is somewhat amazing. Um, and we, we now have two uh, renditions of the memoirs uh, that are annotated. Uh, that will tell you about the individuals and the dates and the overall social context uh, that, that Grant was writing about. And these just came out the last five years, both of these annotated works on the memoirs. Um, Grant's legacy as a writer. Uh, this is something that uh, the more uh, historians are reading the memoirs and the other papers, uh, we're discovering that he was a pretty good writer. Uh, and there's 16 years or 17 years of public work that Grant did as, um, as a general and later as president. So there's a lot of material, 32 volumes worth. Uh, and we just, we've discovered that he's really a pretty good writer. Um, his communications were clear to the point, uh, easily understood. Uh, his works are exhaustive. Uh, letters, special orders, reports, speeches, uh, his memory uh, and the assistance to his memory towards the end of his life uh, by Adam Badeau, uh, Mark Twain, uh, and Grant's son uh, really helped him to bring together uh, what became his memoirs. Uh, when published in 1885, it was so successful that after a few years, uh, the sales amounted to over $400,000, a lot of money at that time, which was given to uh, Julia Grant and the family. And uh, also because of the memoirs, uh, uh, they've been such a well-read read document uh, for, for our history since uh, Grant's death. And uh, at the time, there were also individuals uh, who were associated with Grant, uh, Adam Badeau, uh, a guy named Young, and Horace Porter, uh, who gave us the first glimpse as to who this person was and how effective he was as an administrator, as a general, and later as a president. Uh, this is the story of Grant's uh, tour of the of the world for two years uh, uh, after his presidency. So we have a lot of, of information. Uh, this is some a photo of some of the, uh, uh, the key actors in uh, Grant's legacy. Uh, Ely Parker, this is Adam Badeau. Uh, this is uh, Orville Babcock. This is Horace Porter, uh, who wrote the book Campaigning with Grant. Uh, so these were people, part of his staff, uh, along with Rawlins, as we heard about this, this past Sunday, uh, who were very instrumental in supporting Mr. Grant and his legacy. Um, changing interpretation of the Grant. So this is kind of an interesting legacy because if you read the original associates, of course, uh, they, they really are supportive and insightful about uh, Grant's legacy. Uh, but he had enemies. He had military enemy, enemies, and later political enemies in his presidency uh, who really challenged his authority and his competency and so forth, uh, which sort of created some controversy uh, with how we understand uh, Grant. Um, but Lincoln, of course, uh, really appreciated uh, Grant because he fought, because he was competent. And uh, hindsight is 20, 20, 20 because he won. <laughs> you know, Lee didn't have that, uh, that same uh, opportunity. Um, his, his treatment of Lee and other Confederate uh, leaders at Appomattox was a very magnanimous. Uh, so for people like Lee and others uh, who were uh, the Confederate leaders, they really thought highly of Grant. Uh, they thought he was fair and uh, that he was really wanted to restore in a way that was not punitive. Um, he becomes a national hero uh, after his presidency, very popular during his presidency. Uh, he goes on his two year world tour has some financial difficulties, writes in memoirs, and as we'll see a little bit later on, uh, there were 1.5 million people in New York City uh, that lined up for uh, as a parade uh, at the time of his, um, of his funeral after his death. Uh, the late 1890s and 1930s, uh, that's the time where the, the lost cause uh, began to take over in terms of scholarship. 
Uh, that's when the monuments went up. <laughs> in 1890, the one uh, a, uh, Robert E. Lee's monument went up in the 1890s. Uh, and so it was a way to kind of bring back some memories in a positive way uh, for those who supported the Confederate cause. Uh, Grant's reputation suffered, uh, but after 1948, um, there's a guy named Lloyd Lewis who wrote a book called Captain Sam Grant. Then he died. And uh, there's another guy named Catton, Bruce Catton. You've all seen the works of Bruce Catton, who uh, took over the notes of, uh, that, that Lewis had accumulated and wrote two other things. And it was like the first trilogy uh, on Grant's life. That was very positive uh, and very illuminating. Uh, since 1980, uh, Grant's reputation has grown quite, uh, quite a bit uh, because of the reasons I had mentioned a little bit uh, earlier. Um, here's the, the material from, from Catton. Uh, Lloyd Lewis, Captain Sam Grant, still probably the best book on Grant's early history, uh, and the three-volume uh, uh, piece with, with Lewis and Catton, and this later uh, book uh, on uh, uh, the American military tradition. Um, there were some other books that came out um, in the 1980s, uh, Joan Waugh, uh, Frank uh, Scuturo, and also uh, the work of uh, John Martelek and Frank Williams, who were part of the, the U.S. Grant Association. And uh, they began to kind of recast and reshape Grant uh, based upon uh, the, uh, the papers, uh, the 32 volumes of papers uh, that they were also kind of shepherding. So these people were at the front uh, of this new interpretation. Uh, this book by Scuturo and, uh, and Chris uh, Mikowski, Grant at 200, uh, it doesn't come out until uh, this August. And so I was, it was disappointing. Uh, but, but please, uh, if you read any book in the next year, especially after this presentation, uh, let's all read this one and come back and see what we've learned. Because uh, this guy is going to sum up a lot of what I'm trying to, to say with, with a lot more uh, as well. Um, uh, this, here's kind of two different interpretations uh, of Grant. Uh, there's a guy named William McFeely. Uh, it's really an extraordinary biography uh, but, of Grant, but he's it's, it's kind of negative. Um, he says that, that Grant was an ordinary person <clears throat> who lacked many necessary talents, uh, was probably an alcoholic, but somehow his personal ambition overcame his faults. And that's, uh, so it's kind of a character thing. And then uh, this other person has a different take. Uh, that's uh, Harry Laver uh, in his book, uh, A General Who Will Fight. And of course, that's the legacy of Lincoln. That's the kind of general I want. Uh, this book is a military history that examines Grant as a comprehensive strategist of the Civil War, arguing that Grant's focus and determination help the Union to become able to win the war, uh, due in part to Grant's ability to, to learn from his mistakes. So it's another character thing. Uh, but in this case, Grant's character is one that's more open, he's learning, uh, that he actually has some pretty good skills, uh, but he is pretty much learning on the job quite a bit as well. Uh, so those two interpretations. Um, recent biographies, uh, the, the, the character the characterization of Grant as a, a drunk and a butcher uh, has been especially addressed. Uh, that's not the issue that I'm most concerned about. You'll see what it is in a moment. Um, but uh, Chernow, um, we heard uh, Chernow speak in Chicago. And uh, he said, well, you know, uh, Grant, he's probably a recovering alcoholic. And, uh, and there are instances, of, especially when he was in California, uh, when he was separated from his family, that, that he was in really a low state. And there was another incident um, up the Yazoo, not the Wazoo, up the Yazoo, <laughs> where apparently <laughs> uh, there may have been some kind of a drinking problem. But uh, looking back at the whole thing, there is no uh, incident uh, that, for example, Charles Calhoun could find in his 600 page book on Grant's presidency. That's because Julia was always around. And uh, so in this respect, but that's pretty much all I wanna say about that particular issue. Um, uh, okay, um, as a general in the army, uh, we, we know him, we see him as intuitive, as um, determined, as relentless, as optimistic, <clears throat> um, as uh, just very much, very much engaged. Um, 
He was uh, not prone to retreat. You recall Shiloh, the first uh, day is a disaster. And then if, if you remember the, uh, uh, the little piece on the documentary where Grant says, well, yeah, uh, but we'll lick him tomorrow. <laughs> and that little phrase kind of summarizes uh, Grant's fortitude. Uh, he was not one to quit or to retreat. Uh, efficient, pragmatic, um, although his choices of some of the cabinet officers in his presidency were, uh, were questionable. That, that was kind of an issue. Uh, although um, uh, scholars now see uh, Hamilton Fish, who was the Secretary of State, and uh, Amos T. Ackerman, the Attorney General who prosecuted the KKK, as two of the best cabinet members that maybe we've ever had in our, in our history. Uh, so not all of them were, uh, were uh, so, so bad. These are, in my view, um, in my reading, these are recent, recent biographies of Grant uh, that are exceptional. Uh, Ron Chernow, uh, Gene Edward Smith, uh, Brooks Simpson has two here, a third is on the way. Um, the Man Who Saved the Union by H.W. Brands. He probably had no ax to grind, right? <laughs> the Man Who Saved the Union. Uh, and then this wonderful book, American Ulysses, uh, that I think you read, uh, the Life of, of Grant by Ron White. Ron White also did a fantastic biography of Abraham Lincoln. So uh, those are two really wonderful biographies if you haven't read, uh, read those. Um, now, th these are my favorite books on Grant. I think they're the most important in the legacy of Grant historiography. First of all, his own memoirs. We cannot neglect his own memoirs. I think that these two books by Miller and Calhoun are the best books that I've read on Grant. That includes Chernow's biography. Um, Don Miller also wrote the book on the uh, uh, Chicago City of the Century. He's a fine story that's not a stone that is unturned in his research. He also captures uh, the social mission uh, that emerges uh, out of Vicksburg to emancipate slaves. And so I find his work very compelling. Uh, this work by Charles Calhoun, uh, the presidency of U.S. Grant. Um, Calhoun is a scholar of the late 19th century in America, of the Gilded Age. Uh, this is a large 600-page um, uh, analysis of Grant's presidency, and he puts it in the, um, the context of the Gilded Age. Uh, if you do that, then when you read about the scandals, it'll become a lot more clear about what's going on. It's about big money. It's about people who are after big money. And the government never had the experience of how do you contain uh, the railroad barons, Gould and some of these other folks. Uh, we never had the experience of, of containing uh, these, these uh, broad powers. And that becomes an issue that Grant struggles with greatly. And it leads, by the way, to a panic uh, in 1873 because of the railroad industry. Uh, they're gobbling up land, uh, gobbling up gold, uh, they create an economic crisis. And it's because of, of this crisis in the Gilded Age uh, that Grant had many of his problems. Let's look at some of the wars. Uh, I mentioned that I thought the Vicksburg uh, uh, book is a, is a great book. And let me show you why. Uh, this is Don Miller's book uh, on Vicksburg. And on page 45, he's sort of summarizing uh, the mission of the accomplishments of Grant. It's not just, just uh, the siege of Vicksburg and taking over Mississippi, uh, the, the, the river, uh, which is very important. Uh, but listen to this. Grant became eventually a committed and, uh, emancipationist, uh, freeing by military action over 100,000 slaves in the lower Mississippi Valley and working with General Lorenzo Thomas to put nearly 21,000 black men in Union Blue by the end of 1863. Uh, that's an incredible accomplishment. Uh, he is, starts out as um, very much a part of the, uh, the dominant white culture with all those assumptions. He becomes very pragmatic about this, but after 1863, uh, the, the notion of emancipating the slaves becomes a passion. It becomes a, an ideology. Uh, it's not just something pragmatic for, uh, for, uh, for Grant. So I really like this book by Miller because, because it highlights uh, that very clearly. Uh, these other books are really good. I really like this book by, um, on uh, Chattanooga. Um, 
by, by David Powell. Uh, uh, Vicksburg and Chattanooga are probably the most two significant uh, battles won by Grant. And it's after Chattanooga uh, that, that um, uh, Lincoln says, would you please come to Washington and uh, take over this whole military command piece, uh, which of course uh, uh, Grant did. Um, this is just a little bit about the map, you know, uh, uh, Grant starts at Fort Henry and Donaldson down to Shiloh uh, to Vicksburg. There were other attempts to try to capture Vicksburg, did not happen. Uh, later, uh, he's at Chattanooga. That's a very big thing. And it's from Chattanooga uh, that his pal, uh, friend, and comrade uh, Sherman uh, does the march uh, to Atlanta and the march to uh, Savannah. Um, it, it was, this is so significant because um, Lincoln felt that he was about to lose the, uh, the 1964 election to the so-called Peace Democrats who wanted to just kind of give the, the South back to the, the Southern leadership as they existed. And, uh, but later on, uh, Sherman says, uh, oh, Mr. Lincoln, I have a, a, a present to give to you. We've just conquered Savannah. And that news hit the press and it allowed Lincoln to, uh, to remain in office. Uh, so this is kind of the, there's so many other battles, but um, uh, these are the ones that I think are important for uh, the early part of Grant's legacy. Um, Vicksburg is, is, a, is an amazing story. And this comes out of the, the book also by, uh, by, uh, uh, by Don Miller. Uh, they had to run, they could not uh, get by very easily. Uh, the well built up uh, bluffs in Vicksburg. And so uh, Admiral Porter uh, and Grant came up with a plan. We'll send uh, the materials uh, close to the shore and hopefully the cannon uh, will overshoot uh, some of them, which occurred. Now there were some of the boats that were hit, uh, but most, most of the stuff got through. And uh, that was just kind of a miracle. Uh, and a very, very key uh, part of the war uh, where the Navy and the Army cooperated. Uh, Porter and Grant worked really well together. Um, now here's kind of the overall thing with, uh, uh, with the siege of, of Vicksburg. It's actually a number of, of, of uh, battles, uh, Bruinsburg, Grand Gulf, Port Gibson, Raymond, Jackson, uh, Champions Hill, uh, Black River Bridge, and finally Vicksburg, where uh, the soldiers uh, stay on the other side of the river, but it's very swampy. Uh, the soldiers are able to get to hard times and then ultimately Bruinsburg. Uh, but the, uh, the Union fleet had to go by um, uh, up here, Vicksburg. Uh, they had to get through here to get all the stuff uh, going down uh, the river. So finally at, uh, went up here, didn't mean to go up. Um, they get to Bruinsburg and then they, they go to Jackson and ultimately you have the siege of, uh, of uh, Vicksburg. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, these are three, I think, really interesting books. Now, notice the one in the center, The Unknown Architects of Civil Rights. How many of you would have said, oh yeah, uh, Grant is a, is, a, uh, uh, is a leader in the civil rights tradition? You probably would not have thought that, right? Um, Practical Liberators, you got uh, Grant and Sherman. Um, Lincoln and Grant, working together on many of these issues. They were pretty much in tandem uh, all the way through Lincoln's life. Uh, so this kind of opens up uh, maybe new ways that we can understand Grant as one very concerned about the emancipation of the, of the former slaves. Um, this is what John Eaton said. Uh, this is after Vicksburg. He says, well, uh, why don't we hire them? They can work in the, in the quartermaster department, the commissary, um, engineering operations, they can build bridges, earthworks. The women can help in the hospitals. And then, then I wanted to read you the rest of what he says, because this is very revolutionary. And uh, this, is, uh, this actually does occur in the papers of Grant, uh, but it's uh, John Eaton's uh, condensation of it. Um, this is what Grant said. He did went on to say, then when it has been made clear that as an independent laborer, for he was not yet a freedman, talking about the, uh, the enslaved persons. Um, if she or he could do these things well, uh, the building bridges, working hospitals and so forth, it would be very easy 
to put a musket in his hands and make a soldier of him. And if he fought well, eventually to put the ballot in his hand and make him a citizen. So citizenship as a kind of the goal here. And this is stated in uh, the, the late um, 1863. So, so in some ways, I think Grant may have been ahead of Lincoln on this issue, making them into citizens. And it's like, wow. Um, and then, then Eden says, obviously, I was dealing with no incompetent, but a man of, capable of handling large issues. And uh, that's another reputation for some of the uh, some of the other interpretations of Grant that here's a guy that handles large issues, and has a he's got a he's got a, an agenda here. He's got a mission uh, that he's working on with respect to uh, uh, to in, formerly enslaved persons. Um, let's get to Chattanooga. Uh, this shows um, Grant's strategic capacity. Um, he takes Archer Knob so he can see everything. He reestablishes supply lines, builds up the army develops a strategy to overtake Bragg uh, with three people kind of attacking almost simultaneously. Uh, it's kind of a comprehensive view of what it would take uh, to, to defeat uh, Bragg and, and others at Chattanooga. Um, they are, before Grant arrived, okay, um, General um, Thomas and others, uh, they were, uh, there was a river here. They did not have access to the river or at least they could not cross the river as of yet. And uh, you had uh, Breckenridge and Hardy and Bragg is out there somewhere. Uh, so basically it's almost a Confederate siege of the, the Union soldiers at Chattanooga. And so um, Lincoln says, go to Chattanooga and see what you can do. And so uh, Grant went there and uh, uh, he set up a, he, he got to an orchard knob, it's kind of a hill. Um, he took that over. That way he could kind of see the whole landscape. And he reestablished um, ways to get supplies to, to the soldiers with a pontoon bridge here and the, over the Tennessee River so that the soldiers were now fed and clothed and they, they have a significant military material so that they can handle this war. And uh, then a uh, hooker uh, attacks Lookout Mountain, uh, Thomas, uh, Missionary Ridge, and Sherman is a little bit further north. And uh, the three of these generals eventually are able to, to chase Bragg uh, off the, uh, the mountain. So it's a, a rather remarkable uh, tactical and strategic uh, uh, victory for, for him. And this is kind of what it looks like with Hooker, uh, Thomas, and, uh, and Sherman. And uh, uh, it's within two or three days. It wasn't completely simultaneous, uh, but having three different armies attacking uh, the ridge. Having been supplied uh, because of these bridges, uh, they were able to chase the Confederates off of uh, the mountain. Um, this is uh, General Thomas, George Thomas, uh, one of the major generals in this exercise. Uh, this is a photo op. Uh, I hope nobody fell off the, the, uh, the rock there. <laughs> um, and uh, this is Grant. And uh, this came out in, uh, uh, I think it was, um, I think it was Harper's. And you can see Grant moving up the ridge there. So what is the significance of Chattanooga? Well, Fort Donaldson was good. Shiloh was a stumble, but it's okay. Vicksburg was certainly an incredible thing. But this is what this author says, uh, the impulse of victory by, by Powell. But it was Chattanooga where Lincoln turned to him in a moment of crisis. And he delivered yet another resounding victory to unquestionably elevate Grant to the next level as overall commander of the Union war effort and to secure his place in American military history. So Vicksburg and Chattanooga, just very, both tactically and also the overall vision uh, is, is, is very important for the Grant legacy now. The significance, um, well, it was a, a very important, now the Union had the Mississippi River and with Chattanooga, you have control over uh, the Central America between North and South. Uh, the city was a rail hub, also a river hub. The Tennessee River ran through it. It was a, became a gateway uh, for, for Sherman uh, to take off and to go to, to Atlanta and Savannah. Um, so this was a very important uh, strategic victory for the Union soldiers. Now, what about, uh, this is another place where, where Grant 
gets uh, criticized. Um, I don't know if any of you have read uh, War and Peace. You have a Kutuzov, the uh, Russian general, and uh, Napoleon. Napoleon was the, the, the logical, rational, uh, uh, strategic commander. But Kutuzov, just like Grant, was very intuitive. On the field, he read things as they were and was able to kind of uh, eventually uh, beat even Napoleon. Uh, Grant is like that. He was intuitive. He was not a paper general like Halleck, nor was he a political general like Bukharnin. Uh, He listened to his staff and he identified uh, with his soldiers. Um, he was bold, relentless. He would not give up. His perspective on the battles of Vicksburg and Chattanooga was comprehensive. Uh, he got the big picture in ways that many other generals, including Robert E. Lee, according to some of the sources I've seen. Uh, Lee did not have quite the comprehensive view that, that Grant seemed to have. Um, he recognized the need for supplies and resources as part of the overall uh, 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 structure of, the, of, a, of preparing for war. Uh, he grasped the importance of geography. Uh, if you read uh, Grant's memoirs on the Mexican War, his understanding of, of geography, of topography, is just, it's just genius. Uh, he has some ways in his own mind of how, how the, uh, the Mexican uh, soldiers could have been defeated in other ways, based upon his intuitive understanding of geography. Uh, he was optimistic to the point of naivete. Uh, you can see the naivete at Belmont, Fort Donaldson, maybe even Shiloh, uh, but he learns. Um, he, he remains optimistic. Um, in one biography of, of Grant and Lee, uh, this guy, William C. Davis, says that, uh, that Lee uh, was actually somewhat fatalistic, whereas Grant was somewhat optimistic in terms of their character. And it, that's a kind of a simplistic uh, comparison. Uh, but when you read through the stuff, you can say, well, there must be something to it. Uh, he was effective. He fought. He won. <laughs> um, to the victor goes the spoils, or at least hero status. That's kind of what happened to, to Grant. Uh, as an aside, if he drank, it did not seem to impede his judgment for action. And I like what Abraham Lincoln said. Um, find out what he's drinking and send it to all my generals. <laughs> and uh, so that certainly did not impede Lincoln's respect for Mr. Grant. Uh, he may have been flawed, but he, he learned from his mistakes. Uh, he grew as a person. Uh, I think throughout his life publicly, uh, I think that's a, that's a, a central feature uh, for, for Grant. Um, Lincoln and Grant, um, he meets him after Chattanooga and uh, becomes a Lieutenant General and is given command of all the armed forces uh, that were set against uh, the South. Um, so let's speak a little bit about the Overland Campaign uh, from the Wilderness uh, to Appomattox uh, Courthouse, actually the uh, McLean Mansion. Uh, this, I think, is a replica, replica of something we all know that's, that's in our town, right? Uh, um, Grant's war strategy is a campaign. <clears throat> it's not just one battle. Uh, it must be comprehensive. It must engage all five large Union armies at once. Um, fleeing uh, slaves is a necessary tactic uh, because the more uh, they are part of our mission, and uh, the fewer that the Confederates have, the better it is for us. That's a, the pragmatic thing. We must attack the armies, not the cities. Um, cut off the supplies, isolate the army, and then we have a better chance of, of winning. Uh, Grant knew it's a war of attrition and a numbers game. Uh, there were 350,000 immigrants uh, that fought for the Union. Uh, there were 180,000 African Americans who fought as soldiers for the Union. <clears throat> From 1863, this is kind of an argument that is a little bit different. Uh, I view the Civil War after 1863 as essentially a political war. Uh, the 1864 election, uh, Grant is trying to, to, uh, to stop the war, finish the war as soon as possible because there's unrest in the press because the press is, re is reporting all the casualties and uh, they want to stop the war. And uh, so there's a lot of unrest in the country about whether or not to stop the war or to continue to support it. So uh, Grant is trying to, uh, that's, that explains his doggedness, <clears throat> uh, that he's trying to finish off Lee as soon as he 
as soon as he can. Um, this is the Overland Campaign. I'm not going to go into battle by battle. Uh, notice it's a series of conflicts uh, around Richmond. Uh, you can see Richmond here. It starts with the wilderness, uh, Cole Harbor, and then the siege of Petersburg. Um, it's a very bloody series of conflicts. And then from Petersburg, uh, there's a conflict goes to Appomattox Courthouse, uh, and it's done. Uh, Grant could always rely on more troops coming, <clears throat> uh, whereas Lee uh, was, had a problem of not being able to find uh, more troops. Um, now, truly, uh, the, the Overland Campaign, <clears throat> uh, that conflict was very bloody. But Gettysburg was worse. So was Chickamauga. Uh, Chancellorsville was pretty bad, Shiloh, Antietam, uh, the Manassas uh, Wars. So basically, it wasn't just this particular campaign, uh, but like Sherman said, uh, war is hell. And it certainly was hell uh, for those who were fighting uh, in the war. Um, here we are at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, Grant is very magnanimous. Um, he says, well, you know, take your swords, your horses, um, the agreement is that if you uh, no longer fight against us, uh, that will be, uh, you will be pardoned. Uh, and that was Grant's uh, agreement with, with, uh, with Lee. <clears throat> um, Grant and Lee. Uh, there's been a lot of comparison about these two generals. You can see several books here. Uh, I really like uh, the one, uh, Crucible of Command, uh, by William C. Davis. He's a guy that talks about the optimism versus uh, the pessimism and many other things. It's a fine work. Uh, this is an early uh, book by this guy Fuller, uh, who began his study of these two generals with the same assumptions of, of Grant being an alcoholic and a butcher and incompetent. And, but at the end, this is what he concludes. In this American Civil War, Grant stood for authority and Lee for liberty. Neither were autocrats, but both were servants of democratic governments. <clears throat> Lee could not impose his will upon Jefferson Davis, and though Grant never attempted to impose his own Lincoln, his quiet, unostentatious self-reliance and common sense impose it on him. In Lee's place, it is unlikely that he, Grant, uh, well, let's see, uh, yeah. In Lee's place, it is unlikely that Grant would have done much better than Lee in dealing with, with Jeff Davis. For neither he nor Lee uh, were revolutionary generals. But then check this out. Yet, I much doubt whether in Grant's place, Lee would have done half as well as Grant for his outlook on war was, that is uh, Lee's outlook on war, uh, was narrow and restricted. And he possessed neither the character nor the personality of a general in chief. So he likes Grant more so than than Lee. And that's true of all of these uh, dual biographies. Um, so I think that's just another sort of the, the way uh, these generals have been looked at um, in recent times. Now we get to Reconstruction. Uh, Lincoln is assassinated. Now what's going to happen? Well, Lincoln uh, did try to, to uh, propose a 10% plan. If 10% of Louisiana, say, would vote, uh, who were citizens, would vote to enter the Union, we'll honor that, we'll take them back in. Um, the, the radical Republicans said that's much too lenient. And then Johnson wanted to do it for certain Confederates, but not all, but he did not want to enfranchise or continue the, the, the role of enfranchisement uh, for, the, uh, for the former slaves. So the radical Republicans, uh, you can, you've got uh, Thaddeus Stevens and uh, Charles Sumner uh, were, were very key actors with the radical uh, Republicans. And uh, Grant, uh, he's tried to be um, a good uh, service, servant to um, Andrew Johnson, and he just cannot stick with the guy. The guy is just, uh, it's just too difficult. And so he begins to move more towards the radical Republicans, and he stands up to Johnson on some issues uh, just before he is elected president. And the, the Republicans see that and they say, ah, oh, this is our guy. If he can stand up to Andrew Johnson, we want him to be president. And uh, so the radical Republicans uh, come up with their, uh, their plan for reconstruction. And uh, this is kind of a better summary of it. Uh, they are, get some crit criticism as well. Harsh, a punishing philosophy, 
Uh, they demanded a 50% loyalty, loyalty oath, not a 10% uh, oath. They wanted to exclude uh, former Confederates uh, from office. Uh, they established military districts uh, to enforce these policies. And uh, they believed that Southern states had committed state suicide and had to, to apply to become uh, back and part of the, of the Union. Uh, these are the military districts. Uh, Grant was in charge of it, but Johnson uh, could fire the generals and replace them with somebody that, that was more uh, sympathetic to his own views. And so that was a problem. Also, uh, throughout um, the Reconstruction period, 1877, uh, the troops available to U.S. Grant became fewer and fewer. Uh, by 1876, Grant had 4,000 troops to administer Reconstruction uh, for the entire, from Maryland to Florida to Texas. And they just, you just couldn't do it. Um, so that was a, a problem for reconstruction. Um, so the, the, the radicals needed uh, money um, and that became more scarce. And also Johnson blocked some of the, uh, some of the leadership to carry out uh, the agenda of the, the radical reconstructions. Um, these are, are three books on the presidency of Grant. And I mentioned to you that I like uh, Charles Calhoun the best. Uh, these others are good, but, but, but Calhoun is, the, is the, the tome on this particular subject. Um, as you may know from, from his first speech, ooh, I gotta clear up pretty quickly here. Okay. Um, Grant begins uh, with, uh, let us have peace. And uh, peace didn't happen. And uh, I'm going to have to go towards the end of this piece to kind of wrap this up because our time is escaping us. So I, I apologize for kind of moving forward here. Uh, here's some of the questions uh, that Grant had to deal with. Uh, how do you reconcile the South? What's the role of the president? Uh, what would happen to, with 4 million slaves, uh, immigrants? How do you relieve the debt? Uh, what would happen to Western lands? Uh, what about Indian policy? And also, can you have these other reform efforts? So it's a big, it's a big plate of agenda items. And I'm gonna to have to go towards the, the end here because uh, we're out of time. So I apologize for that. Um, this, these are the numbers of legislators, senators and congressmen that were elected for office who happened to be African-American uh, during the Grant administration. Uh, very impressive. And uh, this was the first group. Uh, Grant also had to fight the uh, KKK and uh, he was able to do that. Um, some a thousand of them were were prosecuted, um, and uh, these are some of the enemies. Uh, Henry Adams was an enemy. <laughs> uh, he said, "Well, the general might be a baby president." Now, if you interpret that, it means that he he might be a good president if he listens to us, or if he listens to those in power, then we can sort of tell him what to do. Uh, but Gene Smith in his biography says that that Grant actually was a very independent person. And he was gonna carry his own agenda through uh, despite these uh, challenges uh, from, from those folks. Um, this is some of the, uh, the criticism of Grant's second administration, uh, Grantism, military dictatorship, personal attacks, uh, corruption, uh, incompetence. Um, did he represent the best of American culture? Uh, Reconstruction is, is bogging us down. And besides that, the freedmen are taking over our country. <laughs> that tells you a lot, right? Um, uh, there's some characterization of Grant as a drunk. In 1872, he didn't touch a drop during his entire presidency. Um, there were some scandals. Uh, some occurred in the Johnson administration and came to, uh, to um, the attention of uh, the public during the Grant administration. Uh, some were actually addressed well by the Grant administration. And thirdly, uh, some were the result of Grant's personal choices for cabinet officers, officers and they, they began to, uh, uh, to look for big money uh, in the Gilded Age. Uh, Grant admits, uh, my failures have been errors in judgment, uh, but not in intent. Um, this, the risky um, ring began in the Johnson administration and was uncovered in the Grant administration. And so that was a problem for Grant, even though it was not his fault. Um, and I think I'm probably gonna have to maybe uh, wind it up with these quotes uh, and then we'll have to take questions. Uh, 
Uh, regarding uh, the presidency, we didn't get to uh, the other story of Grant, but regarding the presidency, here's some really interesting quotes for us. Grant had not been personally involved in any scandal. His failure had been one of poor selection of cabinet officers and how he handled their downfalls. He never stopped prosecution of guilty parties and was often insistent about having them prosecuted uh, with one or two exceptions, I should, I should add. Uh, it is also important to emphasize that the manufactured outrage over the scandals came from legislators eager, eager to discredit reconstruction and the moral underpinnings of his administration. So that's where they were coming from. Um, then also from Chernow. Finally, the grant scandals which have so clouded historical interpretation were largely confined to the second half of the second term, obscuring his earlier successes uh, as president. And then I'm gonna end with this last one and we'll have to take questions then. Um, this is from uh, Frank J. Scuturo, uh, who's coming out with this book on Grant at, at 200 at the end of this year. And this is his analysis. While public confidence in government suffered while Grant was in the White House, historians might display sounder judgment than the traditional consensus in concluding that a man with Grant's widely recognized honesty, firmness, and respect for the law not to mention a respectable and unprecedented record in fighting corruption and paving the way toward civil service reform uh, was a type of leader that was needed in an age of declining faith in public ethics and maybe also in our own. <laughs> so, thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll start with asking if anyone has a question, and then I think um, Larissa's going to look on the on the um, web page. Yes. <clears throat> That's right. Uh, they joined uh, early on, uh, thanks to the work of Andrew Johnson, and so uh, the Congress. You had presidential reconstruction and congressional reconstruction. So that was one that, that uh, Johnson was able to, to accomplish. That was his own state. And so then Congress took over at the end of uh, 65 and, and uh, sort of took it out of the hands of the, of the president. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, pr prior to the, uh, uh, I think the, uh, it was 1960, no, 19, 1867, uh, when the, the military districts were established, the five, but Tennessee, because of Johnson, uh, was able to get out of it. Yes. Okay. 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 Is there a question? Okay. Someone else? Yes. Yeah, I earlier, there's been a lot of talk about alcohol and, and branch alcoholism, but you thought that there was really another issue that was more that you wanted to get into later. Oh, well, um, <laughs> uh, I think a lot of, okay, the, the question is, um, uh, what were the causes and the, the impact of the reputation that Grant had uh, alcoholic drinking problems? Um, for the most part of uh, Grant's work early on before Vicksburg, uh, there, were, there were generals who wanted Grant's job. McKernan, there were several others. Uh, they brought up this issue, and it went to Halleck and then to Lincoln, and then Lincoln sends Dana. So go check this out. Is, is uh, Grant really drinking? And Dana doesn't find much. Uh, there may be one uh, instance um, just uh, after uh, the Vicksburg campaign, uh, but beyond that, we don't really find many of them. So a lot of those accusations were done by people who either uh, were envious of Grant or were disappointed, as in the case of the presidency, that they were not appointed for one of the uh, uh, the cabinet officers. Yeah. Yes, I did not have. That's right. That he may have been very. Um, uh, he could not handle the, the drinking, and and Rollins was there, sort of trying to keep him sober. Although that was maybe more Rollins' problem, 
we, we know now uh, there may be Grant's problem. Uh, Rollins had his own issues. Um, and but whenever Grant was with Julia, uh, which was a lot, even during the war, uh, this is never a problem. Um, and it's not a problem during the presidency, uh, which, which raises the question, why so much hullabaloo about it in 1872? And it can only be a, an effort on the part of those who, who want to replace Grant with someone more sympathetic uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the South. Yes. Our early days in Mexico. Um, Grant was a quartermaster, quartermaster, which means he was concerned about, um, his, his role was about the, uh, the mules and the supplies. And uh, he learned a lot from that. And he was really uh, interested in getting more engaged in the, uh, uh, in the war itself. And there's one famous story where uh, there are some Union soldiers that are like trapped. Um, I think it's just the town of Buena Vista. And uh, Grant gets on a horse and rides it with his, uh, with his body being shielded by the horse as he goes down the street uh, to, to give communication to uh, other uh, Union officers to deal with the problem of that isolation and the lack of uh, material on the part of those troops. Uh, that was the one big story. But uh, afterwards, uh, Grant loved Mexico. He thought it was a beautiful country. He didn't like the Catholic Church. And he didn't like uh, the Mexican leaders because he thought that they treated the, the campesinos and the, the ordinary persons very poorly. Um, and, but but he, he learned a lot from uh, General Scott and Zachary Taylor. And a lot of what Taylor and Scott did, uh, Grant would implement later uh, in the Civil War. Any other questions? Yes, Maida. <clears throat> Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, <laughs> I think we are. I think uh, the, the concern about uh, suffrage remains an issue. Uh, we have to admit we still have problems with racial discrimination. Um, it was curious to me uh, in reading the diary of a, of a, um, of a oh, what's her name, of, of Chestnut, uh, Mary Chestnut, uh, who is a Southern person who was in Richmond during the Civil War. And uh, they did not trust democracy. They only wanted property owners to be doing the political del deliberations. And I worry about that today. Uh, how much do we really trust democracy today? And uh, how much confidence uh, can we, can, do we have in, in spreading uh, the ballot rather than constraining it? So I think that for us surely is an issue. Questions? Yes. With his military background, as I understand it, when Lincoln appointed in general of the army, four-star general, that was the first that's ever been done. But is that really true? Wasn't George Washington? Right. Uh, George Washington and Grant were both lieutenant generals. Um, Johnson um, appointed him as full general uh, just after the death of Lincoln. And he was the first person to have that title. But you're right, sir. Um, that Grant's title of Lieutenant General given by, by Grant in 64, uh, that was the same title that only George Washington held. That's right. Any other questions or comments? Um, any, uh, did you learn something uh, this evening? That, that, was this helpful to you? Yeah, okay, good. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> and also, thank you for those that are on the Zoom call. And uh, if there are questions, uh, I think you can still ask them. And uh, okay. Oh, my goodness. Grant's horsemanship. Uh, Grant was a medium, uh, had a medium success at West Point. He was like 29 of 43 or something like that. Uh, he read novels, he liked science, he liked math, thought he might become a math teacher, but his horsemanship was amazing. Um, towards the end of, before he graduated from West Point, uh, there was this horse that was really hard to tame, and uh, Grant mounted it and uh, ran and jumped very high over a, um, a fence. Uh, that was the, the record jump uh, for decades. 
And uh, he was also injured quite a bit by horses. Uh, he was injured at Shiloh. He was injured in New Orleans. Uh, but he, had, he owned three horses. Um, one horse was named uh, Cincinnati. Uh, another one was named Jeff Davis. <laughs> and there was a third one, I'm, I'm blanking on the name. <laughs> So yeah, he was quite the horseman. As was, let's give credit too. Uh, so was Robert E. Lee. I mean, uh, Robert E. Lee and Traveler, you almost have to talk about them in tandem. Uh, these were both great uh, horse uh, oh, horsemen. Other questions? Okay, good. Thank you again. <laughs>